as a young teenager, I find it more and more difficult uh, to obey parents. How do I have a joyful and willing heart? Well, welcome to the club. I mean, <laughs> thank you for being honest, but I don't know if there is a teenager beyond who doesn't have this problem. Okay, so that's part of being a teenager. You're going to have that, and it is brutal. It is brutal because, um, again, it's a weighty problem because that's what happens, surprise, as we become teenagers. I, from what we understand, the way people who study the brain find apparently from what I've read is the brain in a teenager goes through such big changes. And this is the first time you're dealing with these questions on such a deep level that, um, yes, I'm glad you recognize that it is getting more difficult. Um, one of the things that really hurt me was that I gave up. I gave up, I gave into discouragement. Um, you know, welcome, Adrian family. I know you just joined. I was talking about the question that was being asked was, as a young teenager, you need teenager, I find it difficult to obey my parents. How do I have a joyful and willing heart? Um, as a teenager, as we start to get into our teenagers, we will learn, we'll realize that this opposition to our parents almost is the default. Um, at least that's the way it was with me. And peer pressure, the pressure of my friends became this massive weight. Before then, it isn't quite that way. For example, my children are 11 and under. I don't see peer pressure being such a huge weight. But from experience, in my own experience, from other people who are older, I've seen that that changes. And all of a sudden, peer pressure becomes this massive influence. You know, um, we just have to adjust for it. For example, now me in my 40s, um, I've noticed that the body ache just changes and how I eat, it just affects my body differently. I can't re recover like I used to. So what is sensible is for me to listen to my body, to understand my body and adjust. You can't eat sugar like you used to eat sugar. You can't eat those fatty foods like you used to. You have to adjust. So I think as teenagers, you're gonna have to learn to adjust. And um, the best news that should give you comfort is Jesus was a teenager. And um, that's not pat, a pat answer, but it really is a source of comfort in this way. Because when you fail, the one thing you can do is to fall on your face and say, Jesus, I worship you. Because I don't know how in heaven's name you did it. Because I can, I don't know how I could possibly do it the way you did it. Because, and I've said this before, that Hebrews 4.15 is to me the most unbelievable verse in the Bible. And the reason I say that is because it says in Hebrews 4.15 that Jesus was tempted in all points as we are and yet did not sin. And teenager, you've got a great evidence of that because we know that Jesus was a teenager. He did not perform a single miracle. He did not speak a single sermon, but he was tempted as a teenager like you. And as a boy, he faced adolescence, and he faced puberty, and he faced all the struggles that come with it as it relates to his parents and as it relates to all the pressures and peer pressure and beyond that you two face. He faced it. And you fail and he succeeded and you'll fail and he succeeded and I failed and he succeeded. What I didn't do was fall on my face and say, Lord Jesus, you are even more amazing than I thought you were. What I did was I got discouraged and I gave up. And I said, ah, you know, I'm just an idiot. I'm just horrible. I just can't live this Christian life. And um, my big desire for my ministry with young people especially, is to give them one message and one message alone, which is don't give up. Not don't give up and commit suicide. I mean, that's some young people need to hear that, but don't give up on the Christian life. Don't give up that God wants to make you like Jesus. Don't give up on the promise that God wants to save you from sin, as I came and I mentioned, right? Don't give up on that. Have faith. Have faith that God wants to free you from sin. Is the, problem, is, is the outlook bleak? Maybe worse than you ever possibly could do. But 
um, that's kind of where us who are older need to come alongside you and not berate you, not beat you up, but keep telling you don't give up. We don't want to lower the standard. We don't want to tell you that it's okay to watch all kinds of movies and to do whatever you want to do and to keep speaking disrespectfully the way you're speaking. That's not the, that's not the right answer. But the right answer is don't give up and to have lots of mercy. Um, and so I think there's there's a lot that we who are older need to do. And it's difficult because it's hard when parents hear me as a teenager being very disrespectful. I know from experience how disrespectful I was to my parents and to my teachers. And I do not know how my parents dealt with it. I'll find out in a few years when my own children are disrespectful to me. I'll know how difficult it is. It's coming. It's guaranteed. Um, because they've got a flesh, just like I did. So they're going to be, and I have to learn how to be merciful and not to respect, return. And I'm sure, you know, I'll be tempted greatly to respond in anger and to give it back to them, just like they're giving it to me. And I hope that they will be a minimum. I don't want to sin, but I'm sure some of those areas in which I'll probably say, Lord, I don't, I wish I hadn't said it like that. And um, we need a lot of prayer and help in this matter. Um, so how do you have a joyful and willing heart? Um, God alone can give us this and you'll only get it if you keep going to him and the devil wants you to give up, but you have to keep going to him. And you know, the temptations of Jesus, right? We don't know a lot of the temptations. We know this tempted in all points, but Jesus, we get a glimpse into it in the temptations of Jesus that are written. The three that we know of turn stone into bread, right? And um, think about the feelings that Jesus must have had after going 40 days without eating. Have you tried to go three days without eating? Um, then you'll know what those feelings may have felt like. Um, even if you try to go one day without eating, first start there, then try to go three days without eating and then be like, uh, okay, 40 days. And that gives you just a sense of how hard it must have been for Jesus not to turn stone into bread. But he did it. And that can give you a little bit of a relationship. Say like, Lord Jesus, you know how hard it is for me not to get angry at my parents, not to fight back, not to shout back. Jesus, you felt that because I know 40 days without eating food must have been such a horribly hard, difficult thing to do. And he wasn't trying to commit some great sin, you know, by going and, you know, fulfilling all his pleasures. Just turn stone into bread. But Jesus was like, nope, God didn't give me that permission, you know. And so talking back to your parents can doesn't seem like a great sin, like, well, they are being unreasonable. But we have to look at Jesus. And um, a joyful and willing heart, only God can give you. But don't expect it to not be a fight. Because no matter what heart you have, even if you're born again, even if I'm born again, I still have a filthy flesh in which dwells no good thing. So, you know, we have this impression that joyful and willing heart means no fight. Well, I'll just automatically feel like obeying my parents. That'll never be the case. There may be some cases when your parents tell you to go get ice cream, but when they're telling you to do something that's difficult to you, what is going to come in the way is your selfishness. And God never promises to get, give you a heart that's free from your selfish will. It coexists and hence there's a fight. And um, I, I, I wish I could spend a lot more time underlying that point. It will always be a fight because your flesh is always there. And I got discouraged because thinking I'm supposed to have a joyful and willing heart and there won't be any of a fight. No, there'll be a fight for the rest of my life. But um, it gets easier over time in some of these fights. Um, the struggle with some become easier over time. The struggle with my tongue, for example, to give you an example. It's much better than it was 20 years ago. But it was a struggle at first. If you knew me 20 years ago, you knew that I'd have a very biting tongue. I could get back to you with a one sentence that would just try to chop you down. And the Lord had to do a great work with me. It didn't come overnight, but he had to really discipline me. And through many testings, had to tell me how to guard my tongue. And as I've learned to keep my tongue in check by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
the Lord has allowed me to speak his words. So um, I know that the authority that I have to speak God's word is heavily based on whether I'm able to control my tongue with my children, with my wife, with my coworkers. And that didn't come easily. The Lord had to take me through many fires of affliction. And I know how sharp my tongue used to be. Um, I used to win sports because of my tongue. Because I would get under people's skin in playing sports. And I would say a comment here, or say a comment there while playing a sport to get under the skin. And I'd get a mental advantage over them. Um, in different ways like that, you know, I, I know that because that was in my past, but I had to really go through the fires of fi fiction and discipline and say, Lord, and so, you know, that's true about my tongue, it's true about my eyes, it's true about any area of my life, the Lord's saying, look, you're going to have to go through many fires of affliction, it's going to be an intense battle, it's easier now, but the battle's not over, I think it'll be the same in any area of your life, whether it's love of money, whether it's unforgiveness, I never expect the battle to be over. I always expect a fight. But I have the Holy Spirit with me. And I, I know that the Lord says, I have give you grace that's sufficient for today. So you can lift your head up. You don't have to live in fear of it. I'm never afraid of it. But I know it's a fight. I know I have to be on my guard. Jesus said that too. Watch and pray. Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus, if Jesus said that, and that was after 33 years of being a Christian, 33 and a half years of being a Christian in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, watch and pray because the spirit is willing. I know some of you want to do it, but you're so weak. So watch and pray. Now watch like a soldier watches at two o'clock in the morning, never knowing when the enemy is going to come and pray, ask God for help. So that's the advice given by my hero. After 33 and a half years of fighting, if that's the advice he gives me, well, that's what I got to do. So ask for a joyful and willing heart, but don't expect it to be automatic. I do not expect that. I, if not, if it is, I have not achieved that life. So maybe if 20 years from now I find that kind of life, I'll be happy to tell you how I got that. Um, I think it, the joyful and willing heart coexists with the soldier mentality.